Disclaimer. These videos are meant to be a brief overview of the subject. They are written to meet time constraints while still conveying factual historical information. My sources for each video are in the video summary below and can get you started on a more in-depth look at the subject. On a personal note, if there is a way to mispronounce the name, I will do it. It is a gift and I am sorry about it ahead of time. First, I wanted to make clear that this video is out of order from the series because it never appeared on a single list of Civil War battles that I researched before this project. Not a single book or list mentioned it, and it was only found because a kind viewer asked me when I would cover it. Once again, I am sorry I missed this on my first and second research for the battle list. I will strive to do better. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the skirmish at Island Mound, located in Bates County, Missouri, on October 29th. 1862. In 1862, Union Colonel James M. Williams formed a first African-American regiment in Kansas, comprising mostly of escaped slaves with a few free black men to fill it out. It should be noted that this unit was not officially recognized by the U.S. government until 1863 and the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Before this, the unit was considered a Kansas militia known as the First Kansas Colored Volunteers. Despite not being officially recognized by the U.S. government, the unit was actually very well outfitted by Kansas with excellent Austrian and Prussian made muskets and bayonets. Confederate guerrilla activity locally had been on the upswing. Bushwhacking was common and members of the local guerrilla forces were commanded by Bill Truman and Dick Hancock along with the Missouri State Guard and Jeremiah Vard Cockrell. They had been conducting punitive raids in civilian populations. Union Captain Richard G. Ward was ordered to take 250 men and proceed to Bates County, Missouri. There, they were to go to the Toothman homestead and investigate the location of the guerrillas. John Toothman had already been arrested and imprisoned at Fort Lincoln for being one of those guerrillas. During their investigation on October 27th, the Union forces found the Confederate guerrillas and realized they were outnumbered. The Union forces only had 250 men against a Confederate force of at least 350 mounted cavalrymen. The fact that the Confederate troops were on horses made them that much of a stronger force. Realizing their situation, the Kansas troops reinforced Toothman's homestead for their own use, taking the fence rails and creating breastworks out of them. The European muskets were a godsend to the Kansas troops. The superior range of the European weapons kept the Confederate troops at bay, preventing them from just rushing the farmhouse with their superior numbers. The Kansas troops, however, were not supplied to camp out at the homestead for long, and by the 29th, they were running low on food and supplies. To help aid the food, Union Captain Richard G. Ward ordered some of his men to go out foraging for foodstuffs. They were protected by a line of skirmishers that were sent out to give the foragers some cover fire. After successfully foraging for food, the Kansas troops returned and ate while the Confederate troops attempted to burn them out of the farmstead. They did this by starting a fire in the southern prairie fields. Not panicked, Ward ordered his troops to form a fire line to prevent the fire from reaching the homestead. In addition, Ward ordered Cherokee John Sixkiller and the slaves that enlisted with him to scout the area and find the Confederate forces. No, the irony that John Sixkiller had slaves while fighting for the North didn't escape me either. John Sixkiller and his men were eventually pinned down and reinforcements were sent to free him. This resulted eventually in Ward moving all of his men forward to assist. Before Ward and the rest of his units could be reunited, Union Captain Henry C. Seaman and his men were forced to churn and form a firing line as the Confederate cavalry charged them. The Kansas force was greatly outnumbered, more than 3 to 1. There were 70 infantry in the Union to the 350 cavalry of the Confederates, but they held their line and survived the impact of the Confederate charge. Eventually, Union Lieutenant John Gardner's men reached Seaman and they were able to push back the Confederate forces into the oncoming remaining Union forces under the command of Ward. The Confederate troops were forced to retreat, allowing the Kansas militia to return back to command. Losses were low for the Union. 19 soldiers were lost, including 8 killed and 11 wounded. It should be noted that of the 8 killed for the Union, John, 6 killer, and 6 of his Cherokee slaves comprised the majority of the deaths. Meanwhile, the Confederates suffered much larger losses, with 35 men killed and an unknown number of men wounded. The New York Times reported on this battle, and this was the first time African-American soldiers were recognized as fighting the Confederates. They were called brave, and this put to rest a lot of the resistance to allowing African-American soldiers in the Army. Join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.